Hey, you guys, welcome back to the show. I am so excited to invite Dr. Ben Lynch on today. We just finished taping his podcast. So definitely when you get a chance, um, head over to his podcast and listen to our conversation. But Dr. Ben Lynch is a pioneer in the world of personalized genetic testing. He specializes in epigenetics, which is the science of how genes are expressed. Dr. Lynch believes that understanding our genetic makeup allows us to optimize lifestyle factors like diet, environment, and exercise to enhance our health. He's written the best-selling book, Dirty Genes, and is the founder of Seeking Health, a company that helps individuals overcome genetic dysfunction. He also developed Stratagene, which offers genetic testing to provide users with personalized information and actionable recommendations. So it is such a pleasure to invite Ben on the show. Awesome to be here, Kelly. And it was a great interview between you and I just minutes ago. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm, I'm excited for that to get to people, and I'm excited to share more uh, with you here. Yeah. Well, I just think you are a genius. I've been following along for such a long time. And as you know, from our interview, I found seeking health when, um, after a miscarriage and, and trying to get pregnant again, which then became our little boy, Sebastian, I was using seeking health prenatal. So I found you via seeking health, but, um, you've just shared so, so much information online and I'm constantly learning from you. So I just, I really appreciate your time today. And I'm so excited for our listeners to get to know you. Awesome. Yeah. And let's, uh, let's put the, hopefully the time to good use and, and, and get folks to be motivated to do what you, you say is take that science to empower yourself. So hopefully, uh, I can help them do that. I know you can. So let's start, let's start with your story. How did you get in the world of genetics and, and what's your background? Well, to start my background is I grew up on a horse ranch, uh, in central Oregon, we had hundred acres and 44, uh, horses, thoroughbreds, and it was a, it was a, you know, kind of a, a breeding operation where you had a couple stallions and brood mares and, and foals, and so we would train hunter jumpers, um, and from that, you know, sometimes we would have mares that were infertile and they wouldn't carry a baby, and I would remember the vet would come over and they'd do some testing and, and give some shots, and then all of a sudden, you know, not all of a sudden, but you know, months later, that mare would get pregnant, and I was like, what the heck. Okay. And then my mom was an obstetrician gynecologist. So pregnancy again. Um, and then my dad was a trial lawyer. So that just told me not to go into law because <laughs> I was always stressed out and come home in hives and he would disappear and just study all the time and fly everywhere. And um, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was tough. So like, okay, don't be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks dad. Um, and then my my stepmother, who was an obstetrician gynecologist, uh, her health was terrible, and she she had to quit because her health was so so bad that she couldn't be on call and she couldn't uh, work with patients anymore because she just drove herself in the ground. Med school was a grind for a woman back in those days. In fact, she was the first female chief resident in the state of entire state of Oregon. Wow, um, impressive. So, yeah, very impressive. And, and uh, she was a great OB, but she just drove herself in the ground. Um, and then when I was working, finally, I decided to become a naturopathic physician after getting my cell molecular biology degree from University of Washington. I, I knew I was pre-med, but it was like, what kind of med? Do I want to be, you know, a traditional doc? Did I, you know, want to be you know, a chiropractor? Did I want to be, you know, who knows what pharmacist? I had no idea. And so I, I took a sabbatical from school it's not even sabbatical, but I took time off from school after I graduated and traveled. And uh, in that travel, I realized that Ayurveda and, and traditional uh, methods, not conventional methods, but traditional methods of herbs, nutrients, and environmental factors play a significant role in our life because I started applying them to my own life, um, which was uh, very toxic growing up on the ranch. We had crop dusters flying over our home and spraying chemicals. I sprayed Roundup in shorts and t-shirt and flip-flops. Um, on a hundred acres. So that's a lot of roundup. Yeah. And I was very, very sick um, at a young age and um, my genetics do not tolerate uh, roundup and, and, or, or uh, you know, just toxicity in general. And I struggled from that uh, for decades. And I struggled from nosebleeds for decades. I struggled with skin issues for decades. Um, a lot of sweating for decades. I mean, I hyperhidrosis. I mean, I, I sweat profusely, easily, too easily. And I, you know, I thought it was just normal. Um, and then when I was working with patients, eventually while I was studying at Bastard University and, and after, 
I realized that it didn't really matter what people came in with, if they came in with allergies or they came in with uh, food issues or they came in with diarrhea or constipation, you couldn't put them on a protocol. If we put them on a protocol, you know, some got better, 20, 30% didn't. And you can't be happy with 20, 30% failure rate. At least I wasn't. Some doctors are, I wasn't. And then, you know, you get them off that protocol and you start adjusting it. And that was fine. We improved it. And then we had about 10% failure rate. And then I was like, okay, well, what's, what can, how we can reduce that even more, which led me to genetic testing. And then when I realized that genetic testing and looking at people's genes, not only reduces that failure rate, but improves the outcome, obviously, but it not only improves the outcome, but improves the outcome faster, more efficiently, less expense and uh, less frustration because you have uh, the individual's blueprint right in front of you and you have a map to their biochemistry and you know where their hiccups are in their biochemistry. And then you say, okay, well, here's a hiccup and here's how the environment fact affects it. And by the way, you're doing that exact problem in the environment right now, and the food is also affecting it. So let's clean that up. So genetic testing was just another, it was kind of like the final layer of what we already know to enhance outcomes. And a big problem with genetic testing is people are turning to it first without doing the baseline. I came at it from coming, you know, doing all the leg work and groundwork and foundational work first, you know, optimizing the diet and the lifestyle and the environment as in book, dirty genes. And then only then do you apply genetics and everybody's coming at it the other way because they're looking for the golden gene nugget to fix that one particular gene that's causing all their symptoms. What pill do I take for it? And then they can go on their merry way. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. It sounds like it's, it should be the final straw. It should be the thing that you go, okay, I've done all the work. Now, what's the one thing holding me back? Sounds like that's yes. what you're get yeah, you like. You love clients to do it that way. Well, yes. and, I, and you did it that way. I feel like I did. I you um, did. I I read your book, Dirty Jeans, and um, I think it's so interesting. I'd love for you to go through some of the what you call dirty jeans that can create problems in people's lives. But I also did it as a last straw. So I took your strategy and test. I'd love for you to explain. Um, what strategy is is what, and what some of those dirty genes are. And we can kind of go through mine. Yeah. So strategy is, is a, is a genetic test if you want to call it that, but it's more than that. So be, you, when you order strategy at seeking health, you, you get a test kit and you spit into a tube or you swab your cheek and you set it into a lab and you get this after four to six weeks, you get a report back and you look at it, you're like, whoa, that's a lot of biochemistry yeah. and maps and arrows and diagrams. And it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what did I just do to myself? It's like um, you drew me a picture. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. I have to talk to Dr. Lynch about this. Yeah. And, and uh, it is, strategy is a tool for people to unlock the lid of their own blueprint. Because Kelly, as you said earlier, a lot of people focus on their vanity of their appearance of their skin and they, you know, acne does suck and having dull lackluster skin sucks. Having dry itchy skin sucks. Eczema psoriasis sucks. All that sucks. Um, but when you have your own blueprint on internal blueprint, it's going to be complicated. You lift up the hood of your car and you see an engine and you look underneath and you see all those things under there, yeah. you know, you're like, wow, I know the steering wheel and the gas pedal. <laughs> but I don't know the stuff on the inside. I'm just going to shut the hood and send it to someone else. Yeah. You know, well, with strategy you lift up the hood. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. You lift up the hood and you got to learn uh, how to take care of it. You got to know how to change your oil and so on. And we, we guide you through it. Um, but strategy is, is not just genetic tests because we show you your genes, your genetic variations. Yes. Like genetic testing does and is supposed to but we also show you how genes are interacting with each other because most genetic tests just give you a genetic result. Yes, you have it's MTHFR variant or you have this CBS variant or you have COMT variant and you take this supplement, you do this food, blah, blah, blah. But you don't know how these genes are interacting with each other. And you have to know that. If you have to know that MTHFR can affect the COMT gene and you have to know that the COMT can also affect the MTHFR gene and how do they do that? because it's a team effort and you have 18,000 people on your team and strategy looks at a, you know, hundred or so. 
um, and uh, you, you learn how they interact together. And not only that, but then you look at what the things that you're doing and you're choosing to do or not choosing to do in your life are affecting the expression of your particular genes and what is making those genes either work better, either clean or not functioning very well, i.e. dirty. Um, cause if your, your genes are acting dirty, then whatever symptom you have. So think a moment right now and pause, what are you struggling with fatigue in the afternoon? Are you staring at the ceiling at night? Are you more irritable after, you know, eating those Twinkies? Um, you know, these, these are all dirty genes. Any symptom that you have is a dirty gene. And if you do a genetic test, like Stratagene, it may show you that you have increased susceptibility to certain things in your life. And if you find those susceptibilities, it doesn't mean you're broken. It just means it means that you need to take better care of that particular area. And Kelly, you know, has done strategy and I've, I've looked at your report, Kelly, and if you want, we can dive in on some of your own genetic variations and how, since I know a bit of your history, we can, we can connect the dots there. I would love to let's do yeah. it. Okay. Um, so you want to dive into that right now, or do you want to, um, let's, let's explain what epigenetics is first so that yeah. people don't think that because you talk about it being the last straw genetics, um, and you talk about all these lifestyle changes that we can make, can you explain what is epigenetics and how it applies to people? Epigenetics is, you know, genes are your blueprint. So genes dictate how things will be built, but you dictate when they will be built and how well they will be built and what tools that you have to bring to the table in order for them to even be built. So for example, um, your dopamine in your brain, okay? Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that enhances your focus. It helps your movement. It helps your uh, concentration. Um, it helps your mood. Um, and so these factors are really, really important. And if you know which genes produce your dopamine, that's great. But you should also know that those genes require things like protein in order to function. And then you also need magnesium and vitamin B6. You also have to know that uh, infections, you know, that we can get at any moment through food or water or from someone else or from our own actions, not taking care of ourselves and getting our own selves sick. Um, those things have effect on your dopamine levels as well. So, because if you get sick, your body's not going to say, oh, I'm going to make you all happy and cheery and focused, <laughs> Kelly, um, while you have this crazy infection. So you can just run around in the public and spread your infection to everyone. And, and, and meanwhile, burn your energy and your calories for keeping you joyful and, and focused. Meanwhile, we're struggling here to fight the infection that you have. No, we're going to knock you on your butt, <laughs> lay you vertical, make you a little bit, you know, sorrowful and sad. So you don't want to interact with anyone else. And we're going to conserve your energy and make you tired because we want to lay you down so we can use that oxygen to create infection, you know, compounds which kill infections, reactive oxygen species. So your epigenetics are your day-to-day -day choices um, and the things that you're daily exposed to that affect how your genes are functioning. And so when you have a genetic test that tells you, oh, you have this susceptibility to this problem or that problem, and you feel disempowered, take a step back and look at the epigenetics of how the epigenetics the things that you're doing in your life are affecting those particular genes. And then you can say, oh, well, I don't have to worry about it so much. And let me give you a personal story. One of our children have the APOE44 genetic variant, increasing their risk of uh, susceptibility to Alzheimer's uh, you know, later in life um, in early onset, right? And so when I first saw that, I was terrified. And I was like, damn, I'm a crappy dad. And what luck that I married a woman that passed on this APOE4 genetic variant and I did too. And so now our lovely kid, um, who's a sweet child and brilliant person now is just going to get Alzheimer's later in their life. And two years, three years, four years, five years went by and I was like, you know what, screw this. And so I, I started learning what things that he can do uh, to support himself because just because he has the April 44 variant does not des cause destiny that he's going to have Alzheimer's, right? So epigenetics, I brought into his life and say, Hey, 
You got to figure out the sugar. You got to figure out your sleep. You got to figure out your mouth breathing. No, you're not going to play football and get head, you know, head injuries. That's just not happening. Sorry. You love football, but it's not happening. Yeah. You know, he has a head injury. I'm proactive. So epigenetics is the stuff that you do in your life to help control your gene function. I love it because you are doing exactly what you said. You just said to this can be empowering. It can be so empowering to understand your blueprint because then again, it's that it's that education and the science that fuels your behavior on a day to day on a day to day basis, um, and you have a deeper why than just like oh I'm gonna get good sleep or I'm gonna try and eat healthier whatever it is. It's really like you have action based on based on information, and I love that. Yeah, an informed why is way better than just getting the answer to you know why oh why should I you know, care about, I have ApoE44 uh, because you have high risk of Alzheimer's. Well, why? Well, because you have ApoE44. Well, yeah, but why? Why does that genetic variant increase my, you know, susceptibility to having dementia later in life? In fact, earlier in life than I should. In fact, I shouldn't get dementia at all anyway, but I'm going to get even earlier. Why? Because you have ApoE44. No. What does that gene do? Well, this gene gets rid of some garbage in your brain and transports some certain type of cholesterol and in and certain types of outs. And, and then, you know, it does X, Y, and Z and you start learning the function. He's like, okay, well, what if I avoid this type of cholesterol? What if I eat this type of fish oil? What if I do this? <clears throat> you know, and you, you, what if I reduce head injury? Oh yeah, that could help. Oh, <laughs> really? Okay. Well, why don't you tell me that? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> right. I love it. I love it because it's keeping it positive and it's keeping it actionable. And it's, you're allowing people to go deep into their, into understanding their own biology, which is so yeah. cool. So now that we know what genetics are and what epigenetics are, we can dive into my genetics and what epigenetic strategies I can, or, or lifestyle changes I can implement to protect myself. Yeah. And, um, so I'd like to connect this with a little bit of your personal history, if I may, sure. you which may. we just discussed. And are you okay with that? Absolutely. Okay. And, and specifically, uh, pregnancy. Um, pregnancy is a, is a huge uh, passion of mine to, to support people. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a moment that in your life that is just amazing. And when you actually see your child being born and then holding them, that being a father was like, the most transformative moment, I think, in my life, um, you know, coming out of my own mother and the, the planet was probably the most, but I don't remember that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, you know, holding my first son, second son and third son, uh, that was just amazing. Um, and so I, I, I want to really help people with that. And when I, you know, you can just say, take a prenatal or avoid folic acid or, you know, don't fly as much and don't eat fish and don't take hot tubs and don't get in the sauna for very long and don't overexercise and don't, 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 don't. Um, but if you look at someone's genetics and you find their susceptibilities, their strengths and their weaknesses, and you, you can find those early on, then you can enhance their pregnancy. You can re, you can minimize, not completely avoid possibly, but you can minimize risks you know, of, of blood clotting, of specific nutrient deficiencies, of morning sicknesses, of nausea, of, you know, have postpartum mood issues, have, you know, uh, you know, you know, all sorts of problems. And um, so for you, looking at your strategy, you know, you have some genetic variations as we all have, all of us have, that increase susceptibility to not having an optimal pregnancy. And again, we all have them and to what extent and how are these genetic variations connected and how are they functioning together? So if you just have one genetic variation, like if you look at MCGFR, for example, MCGFR is implicated in pregnancy complications and tons of research, tons of it, uh, preeclampsia and placenta previa, uh, miscarriage, um, neural tube defects, um, you know, it, on and on. And so, um, but that's just one gene. And I don't want people just focusing on MGFR. That was the first gene I learned about. And then I learned that some people got better, some got worse, and some had no difference when I was just focusing on one particular gene, which then led to 
putting other genes together, which led to strategy. So you do have a slightly slower MTHFR, which means that you have a potential for having less of your body's primary form of folate. And we all know during pregnancy, neural tube defects are associated with lower folate levels. So we consume synthetic folic acid. We're told to take folic acid, but if you know your genetics, you know that folic acid is up here and you have to go through like five or six different genes in order to convert that folic acid into your body's primary form of folate. And Kelly, you have a pathway in your folate, your folate pathway. If you took folic acid, your, your body's ability to convert that folic acid into active folate that your body actually uses for your pregnancy is significantly reduced. I'm talking like big time reduced. You're not only MTHFR is slightly slower, um, but you have MTHFD1 and then you have a, a folate transport gene. So your ability to carry folate is also reduced. So again, you can't just look at MTHFR. You have to look at the entire folate pathway and you start with folate because well, that's what we talk with neural tube defects and, and neural tube defects. Nobody wants that. And so you, you're trained to go to folic acid and you know better now, right? Kelly, not to absolutely. Do that. Yeah. And so you changed your diet in a big way. And again, I'm looking at your folate pathway right now in front of me. And, um, it's, it's what I would call slow. Okay. It's not broken. It's not bad. It's just slower. And so, you know, some people can take folic acid and, and probably get away with it, but naturally our genes cannot process folic acid very well. And Kelly, she has a significant, um, uh, inability to, uh, function with that. And then you have other genes too, uh, which increase your susceptibility to having placenta problems or cell membrane issues, um, or toxicity issues. Um, which increase your risk for, you know, oxidative stress and oxidative stress during pregnancy can also be a, a big problem. So let's stop, let's pause on the, on the folate. So you obviously, uh, have two beautiful babies. One, you just breastfed a moment ago. Yeah. yeah. On break. <laughs> yeah. On break. Um, busy mom. Um, and, uh, so obviously, you know, you, you have these born dirty genes I'm saying that your folate pathway is significantly slow, but you have two beautiful children with no birth defects, correct? Correct. Right. So how's that possible? How can you have these genetic variations in your folate transport, your folic acid processing genes, your ability to make methylfolate genes and your ability to methylate genes, but you, you still had beautiful babies. how do you do that? <laughs> Well, um, as you know, I had a miscarriage first. I took a beat and realized that I needed to reanalyze how I was living my life, supplements I was taking. And um, that's how I found you in Seeking Health um, because I found a functional level of methylated folate in your prenatal. I knew I had the MTHFR gene because like you, that was my gateway into genetics. Mm -hmm. I think that's everyone's gateway. Take 23 and me and find out if you can metabolize coffee and, or if you have MTHFR <laughs> Right. or people start, right? Yep. And so, um, so I learned that I had MTHFR. So I knew it was important to not be on folic acid and that I needed to be on folate, but you know, obviously I didn't have my strategy until just now when, you know, you got my report, I wouldn't have known about, about my ability, um, my inability or my slow folate genes, um, or transport genes. And that's part of a picture that I wouldn't have known, but I did know that I wanted to have a clean diet and I wanted to have natural folate from foods, whether that was from like red meat or from leafy foliage, like leafy greens. But I also knew I kind of needed the insurance of a methylated folate in my prenatal. And that's how I found you. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's awesome because again, if you know, you have a, you know, from the learning that you did, you learned that you shouldn't take folic acid. So you sought out a prenatal that didn't have folic acid and instead had methylated folate and, and, another type of folate called folinic acid or, or calcium folinate or leucovorin as a medication type name. Um, so you made that informed decision to seek out a prenatal that had those in it. And now you're also learning that your transport of folate is, is reduced and other types of folate is reduced. And, and so you made that decision to 
make a choice, swallow those pills, even though there's a lot of them, <laughs> to then have a healthy child, and and now and also produce healthy breast milk, and at the same point, despite having these weaker, no, not weaker, slower full A genes, you're able to have a healthy baby, but you also had a miscarriage. So let's say you didn't have those slower full A genes and some of your other genes were not born slower or some of them even born faster. Maybe you could, if you had those genes in different set of genes, you could have actually flown and done all that stuff and still had a baby. Maybe it wouldn't have been as healthy, but you still would have had a viable pregnancy. But now that you know your blueprint and you see these susceptibilities, you're like, okay, I can't grind myself this hard. I can't put this much burden on myself. I need to step back a little bit. I need to nourish myself more and that's okay. And that's actually a good thing. So, and then you, you made those decisions and, and things are, are way better. So and, uh, that's what strategy can do for you and your folate pathway. Um, you can nourish it with food by eating folate rich foods and you can nourish it with actual real folates from supplements. So just because your folate pathway is slower is not an issue if you just support it nutritionally and epigenetically and avoid synthetic folic acid. It's easy actually. I love it. So what else is on my strategy gene that comes up as a, as a slower gene or a dirty gene, something that's. Yeah. Me up? So you mentioned that you had morning sickness, right? Pretty mm -hmm. significant morning sickness on your second pregnancy. Yeah. And in order to process histamine, you have to have uh, a particular, well, a set of genes, because again, uh, it takes a team to process histamine and get it out. And your histamine pathway is slow. Um, and it's slow in not all areas, but some areas. And seeing this is going to be really empowering for you because if you know that your histamine pathway is slow, like your HNMT gene, for example, it's the primary gene which processes histamine. It's slow for you. Your DAO gene in your digestive system um, and your placenta, your placenta makes DAO um, in big amounts um, and elsewhere in your body as well. And this one has slightly less activity um, as well. So, and if you have a, a gut infection, this particular gene also doesn't work well either. So you need to make sure your gut is on point. And uh, if you're taking metformin, which you probably talk with people all the time with uh, what you focus on with blood sugar and so on, metformin slows your DAO down. And if, if a woman who's pregnant and she's taking metformin, she might have horrible morning sickness because she's now, her DAO enzyme isn't working very well because she might have be, been born with a slower DAO like you and my wife. And my wife had horrible morning sickness. And if they're taking metformin on top of it, then it's going to make their dirty, slow DAO even slower and make their histamine levels even higher. And so with you, you have that slower DAO, you have a slower HNMT, and then you have a slower backup route of NAT2, which is the kind of the backup route for histamine metabolism if you're DAO and your HNMT genes are slow, NAT2 will kick in, right? It's like having a backup generator at your house. You know, you lose power, backup generator kicks on. And so NAT will back up and kick you up, uh, help you with that histamine, but yours is a bit slower again. Um, so you have a susceptibility to increase histamine. So that does not mean you make a smoothie for pregnancy that consists of strawberries, bananas, um, and uh, let's, you know, some salmon, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, that'd be a weird movie, but you know, for, for giggles, you know, you don't want to have a high histamine meal. Um, and then exercise also increases histamine. And I know there's a lot of discussion where women want to do exercise while they're pregnant and go for it. You know, if you can go for it, but high intensity exercise is probably not the go because higher histamine levels are associated with every single pregnancy complication there is known about, I mean, every single histamine or every single pregnancy complication, histamine is, is there in high amounts and you name it, it's there. And so if you 
if you work on supporting healthy histamine levels, you work on identifying your histamine blueprint as we have right in front of me with, with uh, Kelly's. I see your histamine blueprint right in front of me. I know exactly how to help your histamine blueprint, Kelly. I mean, spot on. And it's, and it's not just genetic variations. I know you should be avoiding metformin. I know you should be treating uh, yeast infections and vaginal yeast infections are higher risk during pregnancy. These things increase acetaldehyde, which then slow down your methylation, which slow down your ability to break down histamine, which actually increase histamine. And then I also see that stress increases the production of histamine. And not only that, it increases the release of histamine. So men step up and help the ladies <laughs> take care of the home and other things so they can not be so stressed out. Because if they're stressed out, you can predispose them to, you know, you both having a miscarriage and not having a child or having horrible morning sickness. And it's no fun to be around anyone with morning sickness, yeah. you know, smelling vomit and cleaning it up. <laughs> yeah, so, no, no, thank you. Yeah. Well, so um, this is really interesting uh, because I was always curious about my histamine, my ability to uh, metabolize histamine and my, my histamine levels and what you know, that's become something that's really popular in the health space right now is understanding yes. histamine. So what can I do to support these pathways? Um, and, uh, other than keeping, keeping stress low, is there a supplement that I should be taking? Is there, um, is there a specific diet I should be eating? Yeah. So there is all this is discussed in your strategy report. It's also discussed uh, quite heavily in the book, Dirty Genes and the Dirty Genes course, which you also get uh, alongside when you order the strategy and test. So a lot of this information is provided. Um, I will never um, come out and give a recommendation for a supplement first. Uh, why? I love that um, about you first and foremost. Yeah. I mean, here I am I'm owning a supplement company and I'm, I'm shooting my own supplement company, you know, down but yeah, a supplement, a supplement is defined as to add to or enhance. <laughs> Genetic testing is also defined as to add to or enhance. It's not a substitution for a crappy diet. It's not a substitution for, you know, not making changes in your life. Kelly made changes in her life. She adjusted her schedule. She adjusted how things were happening. So she wouldn't have yet another miscarriage. And it worked but she had to make changes. You did not just take optimal prenatal. Yeah, no, I no. got off an airplane. I, I stayed at home. I yeah. got good sleep. I tried to dial my diet. Right. And as, as you shared with me in, in our podcast, you know, last hour, um, you stated, and I quote, or quoting you, it was just going back to the basics. So that is how you support your histamine pathway. But I want to be specific with those things because what's cool is, yes, it's going back to the basics, but which ones and why? So, um, so for example, infections uh, will increase histamine release. Why? Because histamine triggers your immune system to get to work. So it's not a bad thing that your histamine increases if you're fighting an infection. So if you're pregnant and you're fighting an infection, your histamine levels go up. So why to fight the infection, but you might also lose your baby. So depending on the severity of the infection, so have your vitamin D levels pretty good. So you can, you know, support your immune system to hopefully you don't even get, um, uh, the infection. There's research that shows, um, certain types of infection. If you're, if your vitamin D levels are at a good level, say 30 or above, you know, 40 or above, your risk of acquiring them is way less. So make sure your vitamin D is good. Um, carnivore diet, keto diets, um, paleo, Atkins, paleolithic, whatever, all these types of diets out there, tend, gaps tend to be higher protein. Keto isn't higher protein, but people do it wrong all the time. And um, so histidine is the amino acid that is one step away from becoming histamine. And histidine comes from, a, from protein. So if you are following the carnivore diet and you've seen some great strides or you've, you're doing the paleo diet and you've seen great strides, but now all of a sudden you're starting to getting you know, irritable, you're staring at the ceiling, you're not falling asleep, you're, you're starting to sweat more, um, you're more 
you're having a sense of anxiousness, it could be because your histamine levels are increasing because you're actually, your intake of protein is too high. So Kelly, you got to make sure that your, your histamine intake is balanced for you. Don't go nuts. And, um, you know, as we talked about, tune into how you're feeling and, you know, that, that 0.8 grams of protein per 2.2 pounds of body weight is a rough, uh, gauge, but again, not again, but many women who are pregnant are not getting sufficient protein either, which is why we have optimal prenatal with the pea protein, because you're getting 14 grams of pea protein, which is a highly uh, rich source of multi multiple amino acids. So you have to have sufficient protein, but not excessive. Um, another one here is smoking. Obviously you're not gonna be doing that. Um, <laughs> caffeine uh, slows down your ability to process what's called N-methylhistamine and caffeine. Um, you know, people say, oh, you can have caffeine during pregnancy. Well, hold on. Well, yeah, it'll increase alertness and in, in, in all that. But if you're having pregnancy complications and you've had recurrent miscarriages, then, you know, I would be looking at all factors that might be at play here. And if I was Kelly and I had a miscarriage and I had morning sickness, I would say caffeine's out. It's out. No green tea, no caffeine. And I'd be looking at other ways to support my energy levels in the morning or whenever you need to. Um, because caffeine slows your ability to break down in methylhistamine, which then reduces your ability for your body to get rid of histamine in general. So this is a lifestyle factor, right? This is not a supplement. Um, so, you know, that, that is a big one. Uh, sleep is another one. Um, and aspirin, aspirin slows down your ability to get rid of uh, a, a compound of histamine uh, called N-methylimidazole acetaldehyde. And so aspirin, you're told um, if you have recurrent miscarriages, possibly to get on baby aspirins and maybe a baby aspirin or Lovenox to support your pregnancy is not going to be impacting your histamine pathway that much because you have to really support the clotting risk. So you have to weigh it, right? So if I take baby aspirin, I'm going to reduce my clotting risk, but I also may increase my histamine levels. So if that's the case, I better really be avoiding caffeine to remove that variable. And oxidized fatty acids also slows down my ability to get rid of this compound, just the same one as, as aspirin does. So I need to be really limiting my oxidized fatty acids. It's not like when you see the things that slow down your genes on your strategy report that you have to avoid all those things. It's an understanding that they do. Absolutely. And so if aspirin is slowing it down and you have oxidized fatty acids because you're cooking with, uh, you know, olive oil on high heat instead of avocado oil, and you don't have the exhaust fan, you know, or the hood on sucking those oxidized oils out of your, your room and you're breathing them in or you're taking a rancid fish oil because it's cheaper and you've got it at, you know, some store, which is at a discount and you're taking nasty fish oil, um, cause it's cheaper. Um, you know, fried foods. Good. what's that? Even fried foods and oh, safflower, yeah. sunflower, corn, canola. Yeah. It's everywhere. So again, you might be able to tolerate aspirin even, or, or baby aspirin, if you remove the oxidized fatty acids and, and you, in your case, Kelly, you're not born with a slower ALDH gene. So that is a good thing because that would have made your morning sickness even potentially worse. Um, but it doesn't mean that it can't get dirty because you could be having those oxidized fatty acids, right? You could have a deficiency in zinc and B3. So in terms of supplementation, um, vitamin C, uh, fantastic. And if you're pregnant, liposomal vitamin C is great because liposomal vitamin C provides not only vitamin C, which helps stabilize histamine inside your cell and prevents the release of histamine, but you're getting those phospholipids, which helps the placenta in every single cell that's developing because every single one of your cell membranes and you, your placenta and your developing baby um, has phosphatidylcholine in it. And by taking liposomal phosphatidyl or liposomal vitamin C, you're getting those phospholipids, which are helping deliver the vitamin C right inside your cell. But at the same time, it's helping the cell membranes. And so your placenta, your midwife or your OBGYN will look at your, your placenta. It's like, wow, you have a beautiful placenta. I don't see any calcifications. It's nice and supple. Um, you know, we've had 
uh, people report back on their placenta health after taking optimal prenatal and the, the midwives were just amazed and they wanted to know what they were taking because their placenta looks so healthy. So it's, it's, uh, in mastitis, you know, that's a, that's a, it could be a phosphatidylcholine thing. So you're breastfeeding right now. You have a particular gene, um, called PEMT and PEMT reduces your ability to make phosphatidylcholine. So I'm going to click to that right now on your gene uh, report. And so, yeah, you have a particular variant that reduces its activity by 30%. That's one of them. Then you have another one on top of it that uh, says this variant appears most impactful for women and it's located near the estrogen response element, which disables the estrogen mediated upregulation of the enzyme. So that an estrogen is higher in pregnancy. And since estrogen is naturally higher in pregnancy, your body will naturally make more phosphatidylcholine because you're developing a baby, you're developing glands in your breasts, you're developing a placenta and you're supporting your own cell membranes. And so all that is increased. That's why your folic acid goes from 400 micrograms when you're not pregnant or breastfeeding to 800 micrograms because there's more demand. And so in your situation, your body's ability to respond to that increased estrogen and make more phosphatidylcholine is reduced. So for you, knowing that, I would be consuming uh, more liposomal vitamin C um, or just phospholipids in general or eggs. Um, eggs have a nice high source of phosphatidylcholine in them, but eggs also become an allergen. So you can't be having eggs every day. You can have a, you know, a few times a week, but where else do you get the choline? Also liver, um, salmon roe, um, you know, fish eggs um, from... Uh, what is that place up in Bellingham? I, I buy it from myself. Vital Choice. Yes, Vital Choice. Love them. Yeah. Randy Hartnell is a great guy. He's the CEO of, 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 uh, of Vital Choice. And um, I buy their stuff. Um, and I, we love their salmon roe, but that is phenomenal. So salmon roe is great. Um, but taking optimal PC or liposomal vitamin C um, can be help, very helpful. And, and women who are struggling with mastitis, we, I interviewed a lady on the Dirty Jeans podcast who had mastitis and she shared with me and reminded me that by her supporting uh, her breasts with uh, optimal PC, her mastitis went away. And oh. Uh, I was like, oh my God, my wife struggled every single pregnancy with mastitis and she has similar genes as you, Kelly. Her ability to, to synthesize phosphatidylcholine is significantly reduced. So again, if you know your blueprint, you can be proactive uh, towards uh, improving it. I love it. You're just giving people the education to go, to go change their life really. And you've, you've already supported me so much in the last 40 minutes to understand my own blueprint, even, even further. Um, I'm curious, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit curious about what your wife with her histamine pathway, um, what doesn't work for her? Um, her histamine pathway. So she has the DAO slower, mm -hmm. um, she has more than one variant. You just have one, which is slightly reduced. Mm -hmm. And, and we will on strategy and we will inform you if we know if the research shows you that it's 30% reduced or slightly reduced or 50% reduced or what have you, we will give you that number. If the research doesn't say it, we're not going to make it up. Yeah. So, you know, in your DAO enzyme, even though you see a slow bar in your DAO, it's slightly reduced. So, you know, you see that it's slower and then you click it on your report. It'll drop you down to the specific type of variant that you have and what the significant of that variant is, you know, in terms of, cause you, a genetic variant, it has to do something to the gene. And what is that? Ultimately it speeds it up or slows it down or does mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. So you need to know what that genetic variant does. And in your situation, it's just a little bit slower in the DAO in my wife, it's a lot slower than yours. And she also has that ALDH genetic variation. So if histamine is here, DAO enzyme processes that histamine into some aldehyde and then the aldehyde gene gets rid of that aldehyde and she pees it out or everyone pees it out. My wife has a, 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 a slowdown in both of those genes. You have a slowdown in just one of them and it's slight. Okay. My wife's is significant on both, but she does not have the HNMT variant that you do. So the HNMT gets rid of 
your your histamine in your brain and it helps get histamine in your uterus and in all these other areas um, that DAO doesn't work in. Um, and so my wife doesn't have that one, but you do. Again, yours is slight, it's not major. Um, so it's, it's good knowing that. But my wife did have significant morning sickness. Um, we never experienced a miscarriage. Uh, we were pregnant three times. I say we, because it is a two-way street. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've not conceived, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I was there with her. Um, and um, so, but she had morning sickness, I think for all three of them. And, but interestingly, her joint pain went down and a lot of people, um, I shouldn't say a lot of people, I don't know that, but it is known that people improve their symptoms while pregnant, especially around the histamine side of things. Um, because for various reasons, but one is because the placenta makes such huge amounts of DAO. So if that happens, then, you know, your, your body can help get rid of that histamine because it's cool that the placenta makes this enzyme in high amounts, but I'm curious if, if the placenta has its own enzymatic DAO, it gets that enzyme from you and your, and your partner, right? Mm -hmm. So if yours is slower and your partner's is slower, then the baby's is also slower. Right. And research isn't looking at this. And that's the first time I actually said it because your baby's inheriting genes that you have right. and your partner has. And so the placenta DAO actually might be lower in the baby as well. And so even though the placenta makes DAO, it may not be as, as great. So you can, you can do things to support the DAO by minimizing higher histamine containing foods, not eating leftovers, for example. Um, leftovers, some, some women um, will, will come to someone and, and say, hey, I need help. And, and they'll, they hire a chef or someone will come over and they'll bring you a week's worth of food and it'll sit there in the fridge for a week. And the beginning of the week, you're fine. The end of the week, as you get all those foods that were cooked a week ago, you're starting to have significant symptoms. You can't have food prepared for an entire week if you have histamine related issues. You need to have fresh food probably every day. And so that's going to be reducing your, your histamine levels. And then taking a probiotic is extremely important during pregnancy. And in general, and if you're taking a probiotic that's got lactobacillus bulgaricus or lactobacillus um, fermentum or lactobacillus casei, and you're thinking you're doing a good thing by increasing the diversity of your microbiome, you actually could be increasing your histamine. And if you're one of these people trying to remove all, all potential increased susceptibilities of pregnancy complications, then I would not be taking a probiotic with, uh, you know, lactobacillus bulgaricus or, or fermentum in it during pregnancy. I would not. Um, I would be working on supporting a, a pregnancy with known strains that actually help modulate a healthy response to histamine, like probiotic histaminics. And probiotic histaminics has helped so many people. It's one of the top selling products at Seeking Health, and for good reason. It's just phenomenal. And so, Kelly, I would you know, I haven't seen your, your pregnancy course. I really want to, and I, I will. So thank you for sharing that with me. Yeah. Um, but I, I would really focus on, on educating if you haven't already about these different probiotics, because so many people are taking probiotics and I was taking one of the seeking health probiotics. I took probiotic 12 for a long time and in the beginning it was okay. And then after, you know, like six months, I started getting higher histamine symptoms. And I looked at the ingredients of probiotic 12, I was like, oh, there's some histamine producing strains in there. And some people need those histamine producing strains. It's not like they're bad, but for some people they are bad. And so it wasn't good for me. Wow. That's so, it's so fascinating. And it's just interesting is an, another layer of understanding how to, how to bring histamine levels down outside of food. Yeah. And it's, again, it's, we're, we're talking about tweaking and, you know, you running out and buying probiotics, it could be a game changer for you. Yes. But if you're still eating a bunch of leftovers and if you're not working on supporting your microbiome, which Kelly talks about all the time, um, then, you know, you might not be finding much benefit in taking these supplements and you won't because you're not getting to the root problem. I mean, if you have a tack in your foot, you could put a lot of cotton balls around it and all that, <laughs> but you know, you, you know, that's what taking a supplement is. You, you're putting a lot of cotton balls around a tack. So, but if you if remove the tack and then you nourish yourself with vitamin D and, you know, collagen supportive nutrients, then you'll heal the whole faster. So. I love that. What are some histamine symptoms that someone might have? 
oh boy, uh, nosebleeds, uh, motion sickness of every any type. Um, so unlike you and my wife, I have a a very sensitive histamine receptor. Um, so I am super sensitive to histamine levels. So if I have a little bit more histamine in my brain compared to you, I will feel it way more than you because my histamine receptors are like on point. Um, so I, I get very motion sick if my histamine levels are you know not balanced. And I have other genes too in my histamine pathway, which are you know predisposing me to that. So nosebleeds, another one, um, eczema, skin issues, um, sweating profusely, just sweating easily, having hot, sweaty feet, um, irritability. Um, uh, I would say um, cystitis it would be another one. Any pregnancy complication. Um, uh, boy, um, diarrhea could be a big one. Um, and uh, there's headaches, migraines. Um, there's one, great uh, summary articles, and I should be rattling these off, you know, bang, 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 in terms of, you know, seasonal allergies, obviously, um, runny noses. Um, and it's, it's interesting that people think that, oh, it's pollen time. Uh, it's that time of year. It just comes twice a year. And I just can go reach in the cabinet and take my, you know, antihistamines. And then when the, the season goes away, I'm, I'm good again. And, but no, that's, that's not what you should be thinking. You should be thinking, okay, I just added this pollen now, or this dander or this, you know, fleas or dust mites or whatever I'm experiencing. Yeah. I'm responding to this histamine, but it doesn't mean you go reach out and take an antihistamine. It means you should, your histamine buckets full and you need to improve your sleep you improve your nutrition. You need to get rid of the, you know, reduce your wine levels. So maybe during pollen season, you don't drink as much. Maybe during pollen season, you don't do such intensive training. Maybe you support with more liposomal vitamin C than you do, you know, maybe more quercetin or bromelain. Um, and uh, so, yeah, but those, there's, an, I think those symptoms are pretty common. Did I miss I, any obvious ones? I think, I think that sounds good to me. I mean, right away, um, you know, I had major nosebleeds through both of my pregnancies. And I know that that's a oh, quote unquote pregnancy symptom, but it was based on like the increase in blood in your body. But I mean, like I, I had them once every two weeks. Yeah. See, and that, that is, I don't like it when people like is the wrong word, but I don't appreciate it when people say, oh, that's just a pregnancy thing. Yeah. Well, again, why is it a pregnancy thing? Yeah. Well, it's, it's more demanding. Pregnancy is more demanding. And you have more friable membranes. Well, why do you have more friable membranes? Because if a nosebleed is a friable blood vessel, meaning it's a weakened blood vessel. If it's a weakened blood vessel, it's going to break and you're going to get blood coming out of it. So a nosebleed, you know, is because your blood vessels in your nose are weaker and your it also connects with your, your slower PEMT gene. You are, your, your phosphatidylcholine levels help your blood vessel uh, integrity. And it's, it's lower because your phosphatidylcholine production is struggling um, a little bit, but right. you can totally fix that through diet, lifestyle, and supplementation. Not a problem. So in your situation, I would be supplementing with liposomal vitamin C, hands down. Why? Vitamin C supports collagen synthesis and you need more collagen um, during pregnancy. And we're actually, I've created a, a new formulation that will be coming out probably next year um, where it will enhance pregnancy even better. And I'm, all I'm going to say, Woo! yeah, I, I want to share more, but I, I can't. Um, so, but it, it's, I'm really excited about it. Um, and uh, so more vitamin C, more phosphatidylcholine, um, and less histamine because your histamine pathways are, are higher. I uh, love it. Yeah. And uh, I, did, did you ever struggle with mastitis? I had it once with Sebastian. Mm -hmm. I haven't had it yet with Tashin, but okay. yeah. yeah. My just sisters, I mean, my sisters have too. So it's something's running in the family. Yeah. Well, we see it. We see the empty Jafar, which is, is uh, indirectly associated with phosphatidylcholine levels. We see MTR, MTRR, and PEMT, which are associated directly with phosphatidylcholine because Phosphatidylcholine uses 
a, a process called methylation in high, high amounts. And during pregnancy, your methylation cycle is just zooming. And methylation is simply the process of, of taking a, a certain compound called a methyl group and giving it to something else. And when you do that, it changes its, its shape and thus its function. And so when you methylate uh, histamine, it becomes N-methylhistamine. If you methylate homocysteine, it becomes methionine. So methionine is, is methylated homocysteine. Um, so that's all that is. So when you go to the doctor and the doctors say, oh, your homocysteine is elevated. Well, what does that mean? It means your methylation process isn't working very well. It's, it's sluggish. Right. And so a pregnant women really need to be checking their homocysteine levels and dialing that in. You should see it around a seven, you know, I'd say around seven during pregnancy would be great. Um, you know, a six, seven, eight, you know, that's, that's a good range. Um, seven, I think would be optimal. Anything lower than six is a problem. No lab says that low hist homocysteine is a problem. It's a problem because homocysteine fuels your methylation. It's, it's, a, it's a compound. It's like, if you want to make a salad at home and you don't have romaine lettuce, well, you're not making a salad with, you know, a traditional salad. You don't have lettuce. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, it's homocysteine is the lettuce of your salad, you know, of your, of your methylation. So you, you got to have homocysteine to support your methylation because everybody has a negative connotation with homocysteine. It's not bad. You need it just like histamine. Histamine is also great. You need it for your immune system, for your alertness, for your, uh, you know, your gut motility, for your stomach acid. Um, you need all that stuff. Um, so, you know, you just have to have it balanced. So keep your, your homocysteine between six to eight. And if it's too low, eat more protein and absorb it. Eat more protein and absorb it. I like that secondary yeah. part there. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and if it's too high, meaning higher than eight, then I would be look, making sure your prenatal contains the methylated uh, folate, the methylated cobalamin and some additional choline. And I would support with things like liposomal vitamin C and optimal PC as well. And that should really help. I love it. You are just a, a wealth of information. I just, I know people are going to get, um, I mean, they're just going to gain a lot from this podcast. Before we go, I would love for you to just touch on any of your other super seven genes that you talk about and dirty genes that you think people should yeah. flag, you know, be on their MTHFR. Like what are some that you find to be a really big problem? I know DAO is one of those. And that's something that we talked yeah. about for me. Um, mm -hmm. But what other ones would you say that people should look out for? Well, NOS3 is a, is a really big one. NOS3, uh, translated into nitric oxide synthase in your blood vessels. So the three denotes the location. So you have NOS1, NOS2, and NOS3. NOS1 is more your immune system. Uh, NOS2, uh, I think, is your brain. And NOS3 is, is your blood vessels. And it, you know, I don't want to just oversimplify it like that, but just it does, you know, they're, each one does their own thing, but that's why there's those numbers there. And so NOS3 makes your nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a component that increases uh, vasodilation, uh, blood vessel widening. And if you do not have blood vessel widening during pregnancy, you are the deliverer of nutrients to your developing baby and oxygen. And so if your blood vessels are tight and narrow, then your baby's low in oxygen, your baby's low in nutrients, and your baby's high in, in, in compounds like carbon dioxide because they're not going to flow out. So you got to have the good come in and you got to got the garbage come out. And so not only is your baby going to be struggling not getting sufficient oxygen or the nutrients that you're consuming, and maybe you're being super diligent about the prenatals and the, and the, and the food and your lifestyle, everything is just spot on, but you're not supporting your nitric oxide synthase three gene, it's dirty. It's either born dirty like yours, Kelly. And, um, and so you're not delivering those nutrients to your baby. And then since those blood vessels are so narrow, the risk for a clot is higher. If the risk for a clot is higher, you get a little clot in that already narrow vessel. Now baby is, isn't real, is really uh, deficient in oxygen and nutrients. And what's gonna happen is those little clots, those little micro clots can get in various places in the placenta 
And let's say you do have a viable child and the OB or midwife looks at your placenta is like, wow, guy, you know what? There's a lot of calcifications, your placenta. And um, your, your baby is a little smaller in birth weight than, than we anticipated. And uh, you know, their APGAR score you know, isn't, isn't ideal. Um, so you know, be careful here. And it, it could be just because you had a really dirty nostril during pregnancy. And thankfully your baby was born and brought to your family but likelihood of your baby having a dirty NOS3 is also high. So what do you do about that? Well, first you have to understand what NOS3 does. Does it make nitric oxide? Okay, well, how does it do that? Well, it uses arginine. Okay, so do you run out and buy a bunch of arginine? Eh, you eat more protein. And again, protein is lower in pregnancy. And you, if you eat too much arginine, and if you have HPV, you can make, you know, not HPV, but... Uh, uh, Oh my God, that herpes uh, simplex, HSV, there it is. So if you have HSV and you start getting those cold sores in your mouth because you're taking arginine, you're like, oh, damn it, Dr. Lynch, now you're making up cold sores everywhere. And my, you know, this virus is out of control because my lysine arginine balance is out of whack. So that can happen. Um, but so just make sure you're getting sufficient protein in you and make sure that you're uh, moving a bit. Movement is really, really important. And what's interesting also with this Kelly, is, is if your nitric oxide synthase gene is dirty and you're born with a nit dirty nitric oxide synthase, I see it right here in front of me. Um, it doesn't mean it is actually dirty. It's just increased susceptibility being dirty, right? There's a difference. Yeah. So you have increased susceptibility to it not working very well, but doesn't mean it's not working. And the flip side could also be true. You could be born with a NOS3 gene that has no genetic variance at all, and it could be disgustingly filthy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, cause the epigenetics in play mm -hmm. makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So, um, your nosebleeds, um, could also be related to a dirty NOS three, because if you're, you have a dirty NOS three, the vasodilation isn't very good. And so histamine steps up because histamine is also a vasodilator. And so it's interesting when you have pregnancy complications that histamine levels are higher. And so you could be treating or supporting healthier or histamine levels, but the true culprit is actually your inability to synthesize sufficient nitric oxide. And it's a histamine is a compensatory mechanism. Wow. And doctors miss this stuff all the time. And, and not only do they not understand that histamine is associated with almost every, if not every pregnancy complication, but you have to back up and say, is it a dirty NOS3? Is it a clotting thing? And then you say, okay, well, why is my NOS3 dirty? Well, you have to have sufficient methylfolate levels in order for NOS3 to be functioning, which means what? You have to have a healthy empty Jafar. Yeah. And then you have to have sufficient biopterin, which is a cofactor for NOS3, which comes from what? Also methylfolate and glutathione. So again, it's a team effort. And when you read the book, Dirty Genes, we discuss these genes and I do talk about them as a team periodically, but it gets complicated really fast and I may have lost you, but it's cool. You can just hit rewind and listen again, um, or you can look at your strategy and pathway and you can see the pathways um, and how things are connected. Um, but you can see how I connected those genes together, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. And and even again, more reason to take methylfolate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and if you take methylfolate and you feel anxious from it, which many people can do. So either you're taking, you know, optimal prenatal suggested serving size is eight capsules. You, you might be doing really, really well. Generally speaking, most of the time, maybe you only need four, maybe you need six. I've actually come out with an optimal prenatal that is free of methylfolate but we still use a high quality form of folate called calcium folinate, which is not folic acid. It's still utilized by your body and you're gonna be less likely to experience anxiousness and irritability and have uh, insomnia issues. Some people do extremely well. Many, many people do very well with optimal prenatal. Some don't. That's why we created the optimal prenatal methyl free because it's, we needed an option for women who experienced symptoms of anxiousness or irritability or couldn't sleep with optimal prenatal and they needed, they wanted to take more than one capsule out of the eight, but they couldn't. So the methyl free option is, is, is that option. And women are so thankful and they're, they're, they're now able to take their prenatal, uh, you know, in higher amounts with feelings of, of, uh, you know, 
you know, energy and, and good focus without those side effects. I love that answering the needs of, of your consumers. And for all of us mamas out there trying to have healthy babies, I appreciate yeah. it. Well, Dr. Ben, thank you so much for being here. I can't even tell you, I literally could talk to you for hours. And we said that on your podcast too. It's just, it's mind blowing the connections you've made between genes and these webs. Uh, it's like, I just picture it in my, in my mind's yes. eye, just like a web of, of genes connecting to one another and, and how they stack on top of each other to create vitality or, or maybe a little bit of a dirty pathway. So yeah. I, I, I appreciate you lifting the hood up, letting us learn a little bit more about our engines um, and to take just really to just take way better care of ourselves. So, so thank you for being here. Where can people follow along? Where can they get strategy in? Where can they find you all? Let's share all the things. Yeah, I would assume you'd have show notes for they can link into the find the strategy. I'm going to link to everything. Yeah, so that would be the first place. So check Kelly's show notes. Um, and then uh, you can find me at seeinghealth.com. So for, you know, we were a little uh, lost of where to put all this uh, great information for various reasons. Um, so for now, um, we've really made a, a big difference in, in how you're going to find information from us. And that's going to be seeinghealth.com in our blog. And at Seeing Health YouTube, uh, you'll find the Dirty Jeans podcast and iTunes, the Dirty Jeans podcast. So I think the, the best way for me to help you is to, to listen to podcasts, you know, like Kelly's, um, you know, and then also you go to the Dirty Jeans podcast, hit the subscribe button and uh, tune in uh, with me every week to, to learn more because as I dive into Dirty Jeans and what you can do about it. I love it. Well, thank you for your time today. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. And I will be so excited for this to go live. Awesome. Me too. Take care.